Good afternoon, everybody. I am Jose Antonio Sabalgoitia. I am the ambassador of Mexico to the Netherlands. And it is my pleasure to welcome all of you to the conference Mexican Diplomacy and the Origins of Mexico's Relationship with the Netherlands by Dr. Itzel Toledo. This is the last of a series of events organized by the Embassy of Mexico in the Netherlands to commemorate the 200th anniversary of Mexico's national independence. Throughout her presentation, Dr. Toledo will share with us the most relevant milestones during the first stages of the relationship between Mexico and the Netherlands. She will explain to us why the establishment and consolidation of, of that relationship with the Netherlands was significant for a newly independent Mexico. The conference does not only concentrate on historical events. It is intended as an opportunity to delve into the origin of Mexico's relationship with the Netherlands, and from there reflect on how it has evolved to become a solid and significant relationship for Mexico in many ways, including political, economic, social, and cultural. A couple of announcements on uh, how we will develop the conference. Dr. Toledo will speak for about half an hour, 40 minutes with a presentation. And at the, at the end of her presentation, you are welcome to write your questions on the chat of the, of the video conference. And uh, I will moderate and Dr. Toledo will uh, be so kind as to reply to them. So thanking you for joining us tonight. I will briefly introduce Dr. Toledo's uh, Dr. Toledo, and I will proceed to give her the floor. So Itzel Toledo Garcia is currently Humboldt Postdoctoral Fellow at the Latin America Institute of the Freie Universität Berlin in Germany, working on the use of public diplomacy by Weimar Germany and post-revolutionary Mexico during the 1920s. She holds a PhD in history and an MSc in international relations from the University of Essex in the United Kingdom, and a BA in history from the UNAM, Universidad Nacional Autónoma de México in Mexico. Her research focuses on Mexican international relations with special regards to links with European countries and travel literature. She has taught models of Latin American history, history of Mexico and history of the United States at the University of Essex and the Universidad Nacional Autónoma de México. Her book, The Dilemma Between the Revolution and Stabilization, Mexico and European Powers 1920 to 1928 was published by the Mexican Secretariat of Foreign Affairs in 2020. And she has published articles in academic journals such as Historia Mexicana, Revista de Historia de America, Studies in Travel Writing and Journeys. I please beg all of you to make sure your mics are off and Dr. Toledo, you have the floor. Thank you very much, Ambassador Salvagoitia, for the introduction and, of course, for the invitation to give this conference. I will uh, put the PowerPoint. Please let me know if you can see it. Um, I hope you do. Uh, well, thank you, everyone. Go ahead. Yeah, okay, thank you. Uh, thanks, everyone, for being here. Today, I will talk about Mexican diplomacy and the origins of Mexico's relationship with the Netherlands. I will concentrate in showing you two things. On the one side, I want to present the challenges faced by newly independent Mexico, but also of Mexico in the next decades. And the other is to explore how the relationship between Mexico and the Netherlands played a role in this Mexican diplomacy of independent Mexico. Um, as you might know, there was a war of independence for Mexico to get independent from uh, Spain from 1810 to 1821. Uh, in 1821, Mexico became independent first as a Mexican empire. Um, so yeah, the uh, empire was established. You can see on the left, Agustin Iturbide, which who was the emperor. And then after some internal struggles, the empire became a republic. So the United States of Mexico was established finally in 1824. And this was uh, the first president of Mexico as a republic. It was first as 
um, federal republic, but then in the 1830s, it became a central um, republic and then again federal. Today, we have a federal republic. So we have this new country at the beginning of the 19th century, and it will have lots of challenges internally, but also in foreign terms. So which are the international challenges? On the one side, this huge territory has to secure its independence and its territory. And the main problem was to avoid a Spanish reconquest. Um, uh, in 1821, it was assumed Spain would offer an independence probably, but at the end it didn't. And there were troops outside in the Gulf of Mexico. So it was a huge problem how to obtain Spanish recognition and to avoid a reconquest. A reconquest. Uh, there was an attempt to do it in 1821. So in the first eight years of Mexico as an independent nation, both as an empire and then as a republic, this was the great uh, problem in international terms. But it was not the only one. Uh, Mexico also needed to ensure it had um, economic links abroad, especially in regards to commerce. And it also needed credit because the Mexican economy had been damaged with the civil war uh, or a uh, war of independence. And there were a lot of internal problems you know, from becoming a, an empire to becoming a republic. There were also a conflict. So this implied a lot of economic challenges. So we have this newly independent country, which needs to secure independence. Okay, so in order to secure this independence, it was assumed that what was needed was recognition from abroad. It was in a way easier to get a recognition from the Americas than from Europe. And I will explain why. Um, on the one side, uh, countries that now, as Mexico became Latin American, they shared the same challenges, so they understood Mexico's struggles. So Colombia was the first country to recognize Mexico and vice versa, this happened in 1821. Then Chile and Peru, they did the same. And the United States also recognized uh, Mexico, although with some uh, difficulties, but at the end it did. This of course was important, but in this international society of the 1820s, the main actors were in Europe. Hence, it was super important to obtain recognition from European countries. The problem was, as I said, Spain didn't recognize uh, Mexico's independence in 1821. Then there was the Holy Alliance after the a Vienna Congress, this alliance wanted to uh, sure and uh, secure the, the, that countries were not changing to revolutionary movements that led to independence or to republics, but that in Europe, um, this monarchical system remained. So now they have these countries in what we now call Latin America that need recognition, so European countries need to decide what to do. At the end, uh, the United Kingdom was the first European country to recognize Mexico. This happened in 1824 and France in 1830. Spanish recognition only arrived in 1836. So while this recognition of Britain was quite important for Mexico, it was still important to get other recognitions. However, other countries in Europe knew it would become a higher problem to recognize Mexico or other Latin American countries because the relation between these countries and Spain or France or the members of the Holy Alliance could be damaged. So even though the United Kingdom recognized Mexico, other countries were hesitant. What helped? was that in 1826, 
Mexico and the United Kingdom established a treaty of amity, commerce, and navigation. And one of the um, characteristics of these treaties is that it offers recognition, right? Because only two countries that exist can uh, sign these treaties. So what other European countries did was to decide not to give an explicit recognition to Mexico, but to sign this kind of treaties. And by doing so, they recognize the existence of this newly independent Mexico. So some months after the signature of the treaty between Mexico and the United Kingdom, which happened in December 1826, next month, we have new treaties. So one of the first ones is with the Netherlands. I will talk about it in a bit but then also Hanover, uh, Denmark in 1831, Prussia, and then countries with which Mexico had already good relations due to recognition also signed treaties like Chile and the US, and in 1832, other countries. Before going to the specific case of the Netherlands, we also have to briefly consider what happens with other important actors of Europe and the question of recognition. Mexico was recognized through the Treaty of Peace and Recognition in 1836, both by Spain and then some months later by the Holy See. And then in 1839, um, after having recognition in 1830, there were a lot of negotiations to also create a Treaty of Amity and Commerce. There were problems between Mexico and France. There were also claims of French citizens in Mexico the situation escalated, there was a French invasion of Mexico in 1838, and a treaty was also signed in 1839, which again recognizes the existence of Mexico and talks about uh, peace. So now after having this panorama of what is going on for Mexico as a newly independent nation in the 1820s, 30s, let's see what happens regarding the relationship between Mexico and the Netherlands. While the recognition of Britain to Mexico was being negotiated uh, by Jose Mariano de Michelena, who you can see in this painting, he decided it was also important to act to get recognition by other European countries. He was aware that the that these other European countries were afraid that recognizing Mexico could lead to problems, as I already said, but it was still important to try to get this recognition. So what my, Michelena did was to designate Manuel Eduardo de Gorostiza as a confidential agent and ask him to move to the Netherlands. He would move between Brussels and The Hague and would talk with the Minister of Foreign Affairs in order to get this recognition. The answer was, well, we cannot be the first country in Europe to recognize Mexico because this will lead to a lot of problems, but once another country does it, we might think of doing it too. So this was important, but also uh, Gorostiza started to act to improve other questions of the relationship. Uh, Jose Mariano de Michaelena told him, well, it is a good place to increase commerce bilaterally, but also to create links with other Northern countries. So Gorostiza could be in the Netherlands, but at the same time, move briefly some weeks, months to what now is Germany, but it was a lot of cities and uh, kingdoms. So to move to those places or to Denmark and there try to get recognition and also increase uh, economic links. So Jose Mariano de Michelena saw the Netherlands as this important place, which could be the center for a lot of movement to improve Mexico's diplomatic relations already in September, 1824. Let's re, uh, let me remind you that the recognition of Great Britain to Mexico is in December 1824. So, well, uh, as I was saying, the Netherlands did not recognize 
uh, explicitly in Mexico, but in 1824, but what was achieved was that the Netherlands decided to designate a consul in Mexico. This happened in May 1826, 25. And as a reaction, um, Mexico decided to designate Gorostiza as a general consul in the Netherlands. So we can see it is very clear for both parties that they want um, commercial links and these links are important and the consulates are seen as something that will be helpful for this. But there is still a problem and that's the problem of obtaining recognition. And what the uh, Dutch king also decided to do was to send a representative to visit uh, new countries in the Americas. And this was Coronel Hendrik Willem de Cartel, who went first to Colombia and then to Mexico. But because he had some uh, health issues before going to Mexico, he went to Curacao, which was Dutch. Uh, also at that moment, and then to Mexico. So this happened in August 1825 when uh, Cartel uh, arrives to Mexico and he has a meeting with Mexico's president. And they talk about the relationship and how it will be important that, that citizen subjects from both countries have uh, securities to feel safe when living in one of those countries and increase relations. But again, uh, this visit concentrates on questions of commerce, you know, on allowing people to live in the country so that they increase their, increase their relationship. The question of recognition is still problematic. We see then that the Mexican diplomacy and the Mexican government tried to pressure a bit and decide to designate Gorostiza, who was already consul, as Cherche d'Affaires in the Netherlands. And in response, we will now have this general consul in Mexico, Isidro, but Gorostiza did not present his credentials because recognition had not been given. So we have these difficulties in which Mexico is trying to pressure to give me recognition, please. And the Netherlands is wanting to do it because of commerce, but not sure if it will create a lot of problems. So in this panorama, what happens is that in London, the representatives of both Mexico and the Netherlands start to negotiate a treaty. Um, remember in December, 1826, we have the treaty between Mexico and the UK. And already in June, we have a treaty between Mexico and the Netherlands. And it is through this treaty that we now have a clear relationship between two nations. Hence, the two nations recognize each other as, ex as being nations that exist. So this allows that one year later, we now have diplomats. So Gorostiza, who had been designated as Charcheda first in 1826, will now present his credentials and assume this diplomatic activity and Grosse will be not be only be general consul, but become the Charche d'Affaires. So now we have a clear diplomatic relationship, not just commercial. And well, uh, this is, I will now talk about the treaty in itself so that you can see what Mexico and the Netherlands um, negotiated. And as I was saying, this treaty, what really shows is that there is a relationship. De facto, the Netherlands is recognizing the existence of Mexico, and it will cover questions of commerce, navigation, friend, um, amity, and um, migration. So as I was saying, uh, it is the Mexican minister in London and the Dutch minister in London, who you can see on the left and the right, Sebastian Camacho and Anton Reinhardt who negotiate this treaty. It is signed on the 15th of June, 1827. It will be ratified almost a year later, which makes that the treaty becomes active. And the treaty 
uh, consists of 14 articles and one additional article. About amity, the treaty allows the establishment of diplomats and consuls. We have seen that there were Dutch and Mexican con Dutch consuls in Mexico and Me Mexican consuls, sorry, in the Netherlands. But now we also have diplomats, the Chargé d'Affaires. The treaty also says there will be a perpetual, perpetual friendship, but it recognized that there could be a rupture and diplomatic impasse. So it says that merchants from both countries in case of a diplomatic impasse will be given some time between six and 12 months to make arrangements so that the value of, the, of their goods and properties is given to them and they can live or as any other person who is uh, living in whether the Netherlands or Mexico are allowed to stay as foreigners. No, so it is assumed if there is a rupture in relationship, in the relationship, we will secure the citizens so that they are treated as other people and not that they are not attacked for being part of that nationality, which is important especially in the context, as I said, that there was this uh, French intervention later on in the 1830s. Now, in regards to navigation, it assured freedom and security for the ships using the Mexican flag in the Netherlands and its colonial territories and of the Dutch flag in Mexico. One of the main points of this treaty as the other treaties negotiated in the 1820s is commerce. Of course, as I said, for the Netherlands, Mexico is interesting because it has a huge territory. It has one of the highest populations in Latin America at that moment. So it is a place where it would be good to sell Dutch products. And on the other side, for Mexico, it is a good idea to diversify commercial relationships. So they put a lot of interest, both countries, in negotiating what will happen in regards to commerce. So this treaty of 1827 allows reciprocal freedom in the coastal trade between nations, meaning a Mexican, a, the Mexican marina could bring products to the coast of the Netherlands at its colonial territories, but not go inside the rivers and vice versa. So coastal trade was allowed, but not in rivers um, so that the um, trade in rivers would be done by nationals. For the Mexican new nation, no, this newly independent nation, it was very important to secure that internal commerce was done by Mexicans. Another important point um, was that citizens from the other country could use ships, live and use houses for their commerce without a problem. And that they had the same rules that those apply to national ships in regards to quarantine, tonnage and wreck. And also that they would pay well, the merchandise will pay the same rights of importation and exportation as those of the most favored nation. This is important because it would allow that if a country had negotiated later a, new, um, a rule that would benefit it, then the Netherlands and Mexico would eventually also have that favor, favorable condition. And this was negotiated by a lot of countries because they saw it as a very important um, question. And well, it was also allowed that merchants from the Netherlands could exercise their businesses themselves in Mexico or ask someone to do it and the same for Mexicans in the Netherlands and its territories. Um, it was expected that merchants would respect the local law and they will also have um, important benefits in the sense that they would not do compulsory, compulsory military service or would not give loans by force or pay more taxes than those paid by nationals. So the idea was to establish the conditions 
for merchants to want to, tr to trade between the countries. In regards to migration, we have to say that the idea was that the citizens of Mexico and the subjects from the Netherlands would feel secure in regards to their properties and where they lived. They would also have free access to justice driven tribunals in case they had to defend their properties, their rights, their lives, and they would have to pay the same as nationals. One of the main problems when negotiating this treaty was the question of religion. In Mexico, this, um, in 1824, with the constitution that makes Mexico a republic, uh, it is established that the country is a Catholic one and that this will be the official religion. This for foreigners was a problem, but if, because if they did not exercise uh, the Catholic religion, how could they exercise their religion in the country? So Mexico committed to respect that, the, that people with other religions exercise their beliefs privately, and they just had to respect the law of Mexico, but they could do it privately and they could bury their, uh, family, their families in spaces de destined to this purpose. That's why in Mexico, there's a, a French cemetery, a British cemetery, et cetera, et cetera. Um, in, on the other side, uh, since there was a universal tolerance established by law in the Netherlands, the Mexican citizens could exercise their religion both in public or privately. So um, this is um, the Treaty of Amity Navigation and Commerce in 1827. It is the beginning, the official beginning of diplomatic relations between Mexico and the Netherlands. What happens next? Um, as I said, I would focus on these first years, but I also want to tell you briefly what happened in the next decades of the 19th century. Um, there is a lot of changes in Mexico. As I said at the beginning in the 1830s, Mexico, it becomes from being a, a federal republic to a central republic. This creates problems. The country has to internally um, put a lot of resources on solving these uh, questions. Then there's the Texas independence in 1835. Then the French intervention in 1839. So it's very complicated. There will be later be internal revolutions, a uh, civil war between conservatives and liberals. So what happens with the relationship with the Netherlands? Uh, well, ha it happens what happens with a lot of other relationships uh, in this period. And that is that the relationship remains, but it is not given too much attention. So on the one side, yes, Mexico has in the 1830s, a uh, legation in the Netherlands. And it also establishes a consulate in Rotterdam in 1837. But by 1843, it is decided that Mexico cannot maintain, economically maintain the legation in Amsterdam. So it will be closed. And even it is closed, the relationship will remain the diplomatic relationship. It is understood it will remain, but there will be no representative of Mexico in Amsterdam. And um, what happens in the 1850s is that it is decided that the consulate of Rotterdam and Amsterdam will work together. Um, this information can be found in the uh, Mexican archive of diplomatic of the Ministry of Foreign Affairs. Um, and it is clear when you go to the archive, there is um, documents on the 1820s where you see the negotiation of the treaty, the attempts of Gorostiza to obtain recognition. And then there's a lack of information of what happens in the 30s, 40s, 50s. And it is exactly because, as I was saying, there were a lot of internal countries. So, the relationship remains, but not much attention is 
even to eat. And this happens with other European countries. No, it's not only in this case, but others as well. But I, as I was saying the relationship remains. But um, so as I was saying, there's a civil war between the two projects, the conservative and the liberal one at the end of the 1850s. In 1861, the, libera, the liberals won. But again, there's a lot of economic problems. So what is decided by President Benito Juarez, who you can see here at the bottom, is that Mexico cannot pay its debt, debt anymore. And it will not pay it for two years. When Benito Juarez says this, the diplomats of the countries who owned most of the debt, meaning France, Britain, and Spain, decide that this is not possible and ask for support from their countries. So there is a convention in London and the government from Great Britain, uh, Spain and France decide to intervene the port of Veracruz and the Gulf of Mexico. They come, Benito Juarez sends someone to negotiate so that they leave. But the French troops remained in Mexico and the French intervention began. The French intervention lasted until 1867 and it led to the establishment of a new Mexican empire, the second Mexican empire, who was guided by Maximilian of Habsburg. And the French intervention was which I'll, uh, achieves from 1862 to 64 is to um, take Mexico City. So Maximilian of Habsburg will govern from Mexico City. And in diplomatic terms from the period, whoever had the city was the official uh, government. And that's the government with whom uh, one had to have diplomatic relationships. But President Benito Juarez was fighting against the Second Mexican Empire, Empire and the Republic was going on, but in the north, northern um, states of the country. So now we have two governments in the same territory arguing they're the true government and that they are the ones who have to have relations, relations abroad and not the other one. So what does happen with the Netherlands in this context? Emperor Maximilian of Habsburg expected diplomatic recognition as the Second Mexican Empire from the Netherlands. And he did not only expect recognition, but also that the Netherlands sent someone as Dutch representative. On the other side, Benito Juarez expected the Netherlands and other European countries to continue their relation, hence not to recognize Emperor Maximilian of Habsburg. It is interesting that something that the Netherlands decides to do is to not send someone as representative of the Netherlands to Mexico, which contrasts with what other countries in Europe did, like um, Prussia or Denmark and Belgium, etc and also some uh, Latin American countries like Guatemala and Brazil. So they did recognize Emperor Maximilian and send uh, representatives, but at the beginning, the Netherlands decided not to send someone. However, um, also in 1864, Francisco de Paula Yarrangois was received in the Hague as representative of the Second Mexican Empire. So it is seen as he recognized the existence of the Second Mexican Empire and that relations were to be done with this um, government, well, the, with this empire in that was governing from Mexico City and the relationship with the Republic led by Benito Juarez was broken because it was assumed, it was assumed this didn't exist anymore. Um, two years later, Jose de Corio is also received, uh, received by the Dutch government. So the problem is 
that then, well, the French intervention continues supporting Maximilian of Habsburg, but then there's problems in Europe with the increase of the strength of Prussia. And the French emperor decides that the troops cannot remain in Mexico because they will be needed against Prussia. So they are, they have to go back. And this weakens a lot where Maximilian and conservatives are trying to achieve with the Second Mexican Empire and allows the Republic to become even stronger. Uh, by June 1867, the Mexican Republic has won and this moment is seen as a new independence because Mexico did uh, achieve to win against the French army, against an European intervention. And as part of this new independence, diplomacy is also changed. So now it is not um, attempted to obtain recognition or to strengthen relations in diplomatic or commercial terms, but a doctrine called uh, Juarista, the Juarista doctrine is established. And the Juarista doctrine says, import, sets important guides. For example, that it is understood that those countries who recognized or supported the Second Mexican Empire diplomatically, economically, military, those relations are seen as broken. On the other side, it says that yes, Mexico does want to have diplomatic relations, but it will only have relations when those countries come to Mexico or will come to Mexican diplomats and say, let's uh, restore the relation to be friends again. And the third point is that all the treaties that were signed until 1867 are seen as non-existent and they will be not applied anymore. So new treaties need to be negotiated and they have to be fair for Mexico. So what happens next, no? As it's been established, Mexico and the Netherlands will have a no more a diplomatic relation as happened with other countries, um, no, which are, you can see here. So very slowly relations are restored. In 1869 with the North German Confederation, which says, well, we actually did not uh, recognize him as we were not this German Confederation at the moment. So let's start relations. Uh, Italy argues something uh, similar, then Spain is more like, well, uh, yes, it was wrong, but let's restore relations. And it is at the end of the 1870s and in the first half of the 1880s that the relations with Belgium, France, and the United Kingdom are restored. These countries, um, of course, uh, Belgium is important because Carlota was from Belgium and France had uh, supported military the empire. And these countries, of course, um, were very hesitant, but at the end decided, okay, and as the same as Austria by the beginning of the 19th century, they said like, okay, let's restore relations and let's eventually create new, diplom uh, new commercial treaties. Um, I will explore, explain in a bit what happened exactly with the Netherlands, but again, I want to give you the panorama of what is happening at the end of the uh, 19th century so that you're aware of how, when we understand the Dutch-Mexican case, we have to have awareness of what is going on with other countries. So as you can see, this is the North German Federation the country in Europe that restores relations first. And then it is now with the German empire in 1882 that a treaty of amity, commerce and navigation is established. And this will be the guide for the next treaties. And treaties that recognize, uh, uh, sorry, uh, treaties that restore relations with Mexico in the 18th, 80s 
also signed treaties. We have Sweden uh, in 1885, then France, then the United Kingdom, and then treaties with countries with which Mexico had, had not close relations, uh, broken relations in the 1867, or which hadn't had relations before, established treaties of amity commerce and navigation. And in this sense, the relationship started. This is a case of Japan, but later also at the end of the 19th century with China. And uh, well, we will see now the case of the Netherlands. Um, you can see it you know, uh, in this line that happens in 1897. But in order to understand this treaty, we first have to understand how the relations were restored between the Netherlands and Mexico. So as I was saying, uh, the Netherlands did not send a representative to Mexico while the second Mexican empire existed. Still, the relationship was assumed as broken. But what is different than the relations with other countries from Europe uh, is that Mexico allowed that there was a consul of the Netherlands in Veracruz, Mexico, already by 1878. And his name was Maurice Philippe. And even though the relationship in diplomatic terms was uh, broken, it was allowed that he that there existed a uh, a Dutch consul in Mexico. And this was the only case that Mexico allowed it. Due to this situation, Angel Nunez Ortega, who was a Mexican diplomat in Belgium, in 1880, he attempted to restore diplomatic relations between Mexico and the Netherlands. So since he was uh, quite near, he talked with the Minister of Foreign Affairs and asked what the relationship could be with the Netherlands. And the Dutch minister said, we are uh, very interested in restoring this diplomatic relation, but uh, currently we would not send a representative to negotiate this re uh, restoration, but maybe Mexico can send someone. And then the Mexican government said, no, as the doctrine Juarez said, the Juarez doctrine established, we have to wait for the Dutch to decide to send someone to negotiate this restoration of relations. So the relation remained broken, the diplomatic relation. Um, this changed only in 1897 with the Treaty of Commerce and Amity which as I said, was guided by the one Mexico um, signed in 1882 with uh, the German empire. It also looked for um, favorable relations, no? this, um, favor, this clause of the most favorite nation that if one country got better conditions than everyone would. It also um, established that there would be no claims from the Netherlands that would lead to an intervention. This was important. This was not something present in the 1827 uh, treaty, but now in the 1897, yes. And again, it is a treaty that leads to the establishment of diplomats in both countries. Uh, once the treaty was negotiated and signed, uh, relations are seen as existent and two years later, Jesus Senil, uh, who you can see uh, here, uh, was sent to participate at the Hague Convention of 1899. And as part of this um, representation of Mexico at this peace conference, he also talked with the Minister of Foreign Relations. And it was said, well, it is now time to establish a representation formally in diplomatic terms. So yes, the relation, diplomatic relation exists thanks to the treaty, but now let's have representatives. And what was decided is that the Dutch minister in the US would now also be the Dutch minister in Mexico and the Mexican minister in Belgium would also be the minister for the Netherlands. And well, you can see both the ministers from 1899 here, 
And well, I will end now, but uh, before that, I just also wanted to mention that in 1907, a treaty of extradition between the two countries was signed. This also happened in other relations of Mexico, uh, for example, with Spain and with Belgium. So we can see the relationship between Mexico and the Netherlands became stable now. Um, they have diplomatic representations, the Dutch representative would attend the celebrations of Mexico's um, centenary of independence and well, the good relationship still exists now, but as you could see, it was first quite problematic, but now we would have, a, we will have a stable diplomatic relations until nowadays. Uh, thanks a lot for listening to me and I hope you enjoyed it. Uh, have interesting questions. Thank you. So thank you very much, doctor. And uh, Dr. Toledo, it was most interesting. And uh, it is also very significant to me to find out that I am sitting in the chair of Manuel Eduardo de Gorostiza. So uh, I now know something new. And um, thank you very much for your, for your presentation. I opened the, the chat for any questions that uh, the, our audience would want to, to ask you. Maybe, well, uh, we allow them some time for uh, for writing their questions, I would like to make first uh, a comment and then ask you a couple of things. Um, the comment is that even though you stopped in, in 1900, uh, it is very important that uh, you portrayed Mexico's struggle to achieve recognition from uh, other countries as an independent nation. That was the rule at the time. And if you were not recognized, you basically were cut off from financing. You were cut off from trade. You were uh, isolated in the world. So even in the 19th century recognition, that is the value of recognition. And we then had in 1910 to 1920, the Mexican revolution. And again, the governments that resulted from the Mexican Revolution had to face new, new efforts or had to, again, face a struggle to get recognition as the new government, the new governments that were the product of this re uh, revolution, which was basically the overthrowing of the dictatorship of Porfirio Diaz. So we see that in two very long and very key periods in our history, recognition by other states of the Mexican nation, of the Mexican statehood, is, uh, is, makes the country vulnerable to pressures from abroad. So after the Mexican Revolution, we developed by the then foreign minister, Genaro, Genaro Estrada, what is a, one of Mexico's uh, contributions to international law and to diplomatic practice, which is the Estrada Doctrine. And many people confuse Extra Estrada Doctrine with, um, with the, the expression by Mexico of non-intervention. And it is related to the principle of non-intervention, which for Mexican foreign policy is very important. But the Estrada Doctrine deals mainly, almost exclusively, with recognition of governments. So what the Estrada Doctrine does not say that we will not intervene, what the Estrada Doctrine says, if there is a change of government in another country, we will not engage in this exercise of I recognize you or I do not recognize you. If we believe that that government is legitimate, the new government is legitimate, we will designate a, 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 a diplomatic representative to that country. If we believe that country is not legitimate or that new government is a result of a coup d'etat or an illegitimate way to achieve power, 
we will withdraw our diplomatic representatives, but we will not express ourselves in terms of recognition. So I thank the, you for the opportunity to make this position because I think that it is one of the most commonly, mis uh, most widespread and common mistakes when talking about Mexican foreign policy. So that's the, the comment. Now, I have a couple of questions, but I'll do it one by one. Again, when you uh, give us this uh, perspective on Mexico's 19th century um, developments with the European powers and this interaction in which we see that trade is very key as a, as a driver of the relationship with the, with the European nations, there are two factors that are kind of between the lines. So I would like you to find to, to see if you could be a little bit more uh, uh, explicit about them. The first one is, and you did not uh, mention it in detail, but our 19th century, in terms of domestic politics and in terms of establishing the institutions of a state of, of stability in the state is very chaotic. Mexico's nation, 19th century is uh, extremely unstable. We, I don't know how many presidents we had, but we basically, president, governments didn't stay long. And this struggle first between conservatives and liberals, and then between centralists and federalists, between monarchists and republicans, it became, it made us vulnerable. So that is one of the between the lines uh, factors that, uh, that I, I would like you to, to exp more, be, make more explicit. The other one is the United States. The United States at this time, when we are having this domestic chaos in Mexico, when we are having this uh, behavior in, in Europe, is having a very aggressive expansionist, territorial expansionist policy, or for it, their foreign policy is to drive territorial purchases or conquest to get them to the Pacific coast. And they pursue it along the 19th century very, very consistently. So the question is, can the European nations Had, would have been able to be a counterbalancing factor in Mexico's relationship with the United States, or it was difficult because we just were too unstable and we weren't able to put our house in order. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, yes, uh, thank you also for the comment because I've also seen this problem that the Estrada doctrine is seen as non-intervention, but that actually is more the Carranza doctrine. And as you said, the Estrada doctrine is more in regards to recognition of government. So yes, it is always important to use the space to clarify it. So thank you. Uh, yes, in regard of your, of your question, there are a lot of problems in, in the 19th century. You no, know? First, we have a Mexican empire, then we have a federal republic, then we have a central republic, then we have again a federal republic. Mexico loses first Texas in 1835, then in 1848, uh, we lose half of the country, of the territory in, to the US. So all these changes, of the territory also imply a lot of changes in regards of what country is it being built and how do you use the money that exists and that is obtained, no? So for example, between the British recognition in 1824 and the signature of the treaty in 1826, in 1825, Mexico gets two British um, credits, no? And this foreign credit is used not for infrastructure or to repair economic problems. No, it is used to pay the army. So the money that Mexico gets becomes later a problem. And this part of this 
reason for the British government to decide to intervene in 1861 because this credit became a huge debt that is now a problem and British citizens are uh, asking for changes and to secure that Mexico is uh, stable. And of course, what they want is to get paid. So this is also a good example of the chaos. What all these changes in government, all this losing more, uh, territory also implies more problems, more difficulties to stabilize finances. Ergo, whenever Mexico gets a, a negotiates a convention so that the percentage that has to be paid for the credits is diminished. Well, it is good, but actually not much happens because then more debt is still existing because no one can pay it. And of course, that's why in 1861, uh, Benito Juarez says, we cannot pay for two years because 70% of the, the money that is um, obtained in customs has to be paid for the debt, 70%. So from all importation and exportation, Mexico only has 30%. Uh, of course, they have to do it because they committed to do it, but still it's a problem, no? A lot of chaos and it increases and increases. Uh, so it's a lot of, in of instability. Um, in regards to the relationship with the US, I think, um, well, yes, my position is that from 1820 to 1867, the important relation for Mexico is not with the US. It is important, but the most important is with Europe because most of the trade is not made with the US. It's made with European countries until 1876. 88, 85% of Mexico's commerce was done with Europe and 20 was with the US. Why? Because commerce could not be done uh, through uh, the territory. It had to be by done, it had to be done by sea because of course there were not good communications. No? So the relation with Europe was very important. Uh, in economic terms. So this only changes due to the establishment of trains. Um, yes, no, so we have trains who will transport merchandise and then everything is changed by 1910. Mexico's commerce is, it's 80% of Mexico's commerce is done now with the US. So it completely changed. So it is this the reason for the Porfirian regime to say, okay, this is changing. So we really now need that Euro becomes the counterbalance because before it didn't need a counterbalance because Europe was the most important um, partner. But since there were a lot of countries, there was no dependency. So it was not problem. But now with the US being so close, thanks to the the train system, then it becomes a problem. Uh, so thank you for your question. You said you had another one. I have another one, but I have one already from the audience. Uh -huh. And it is a little bit beyond your, your subject. So you really honestly tell us if you can, if, if you cannot uh, provide any response to that, I will do very briefly give some main two, three main uh, keys to the uh, response to, to, the, to Mr. Eric Mujia, okay. uh, who says, how has Mexico enhanced its public diplomacy regarding relationship building efforts with the diaspora community? Uh, maybe you can first ah. give some and then I'll think about it. Yes, thank you. Okay, well, well, Eric, let me just very briefly, even though this is very out of the, of the subject of the Dr. Toledo's conference, for Mexico, the relationship with Mexicans abroad is very important. Is we believe we have a, we have a, a very strong uh, commitment to keep uh, engaged with Mexicans living abroad. 
And we consider that Mexicans abroad are part of the Mexican nation, just as Mexicans living in the national territory. We have about 20 million Mexicans who are either born in Mexico or first descendants born uh, in the United States, in the United States. So most of our uh, diaspora is uh, Mexicans migrating to the US. And um, we have very strong uh, government policies to keep them engaged and to keep them uh, close to the, to the nation. Two or three examples. Mexico has the largest consular network of any country in another. And that is our consular network in North America, both in the US and Canada. We have 57 consulates in the US and Canada, 50 in the United States, and seven in Canada. No other country has as many as we have in the United States. So um, we provide them services and provide them with consular protection for the rights. And um, also we uh, allow them to, uh, to, to, to rely on us for their connection to Mexico. And we also uh, have very strong policies to help them not only be engaged with Mexico, but also insert themselves become part of the American society, of the US society. So uh, that will be my, my very short answer to your very important question, Eric. And now we have another one. From uh, maybe I can say you something. Can say something? OK, good. Yeah. Um, yeah, sorry. It's just I was thinking in the 19th century. So I was very like, um, there was not really a, a lot of Mexican community in the Netherlands. Um, or anywhere. Or anywhere. <laughs> yeah, in the 19th century. You know, this happens more in the 20th century. Uh, yes, for example, uh, for my PhD thesis, I worked on the 1920s. And you can already see a lot of efforts that still exist nowadays. So, yes, it's a consular uh, help, but also something very important, and is the celebration of Mexican independence every September. No, because this is the moment where Mexicans can meet with their representatives and feel at home. And it is important you know, to have these spaces and to, to and I am thinking of a diplomat Alfonso Reyes, who was Mexico's representative in France uh, in 1825-27. And for example, while he was there, a musician Carlos Chavez would sing Mexican songs to the Mexican community. So um, this is something that has been done for a long, long time in the 20th century and now in the 21st one as well. So I just wanted to mention that that example and that to say that this happens uh, more in the in the 20th, 21st century. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, Doctor David Murrieta has a, a question that is closer to home. Was there any cultural exchange in this relationship in the 19th century? He means basically the Netherlands and Mexico and by extension, European countries and Mexico. Mexico must have been seen as very exotic at the time. Uh, yes, uh, thank you, David Murrieta. Uh, um, yes, well, this exchange happens mainly through the writing of travel writers. So it will be uh, Dutch and other European uh, nationals who travel to Mexico. And of course, they are following the steps of Alexander von Humboldt, you know, who talked about all these marvelous uh, opportunities and the marvelous uh, geography and uh, nature one could find in Mexico. So throughout the 19th century, we will see a lot of travelers who do this. And there's also the case of Dutch uh, travelers who did the same. And um, it's just the other day <laughs> I was reading the case of one of them, but I forgot the name, but I will tell it to you just now, whose name was um, Jacob Villoimia, who in 1903 traveled to Mexico 
And yes, he talked about these beautiful sceneries he saw, but he also mentioned the project of modernization, which was happening at the beginning of the 19th, the, of the 20th century with Porfirio Diaz, uh, because he, for, for example, mentioned uh, a lot of um, streets are being built up. Uh, he also says, ah, we're moving thanks to the trains. And he's another example of another traveler from Europe that will connect and see how the America, the uh, US citizens are becoming stronger in Mexico's economy. Because he will say, ah, there's uh, enterprises run by US citizens and there's um, a lot of people who speak English. So yes, I think in the 19th century, the way of these cultural relations were done through these travel writers who would publish their books. And then also by the end of the 19th century, beginning of the 20s, uh, through archeologists who would start to get interested in what is going on in Mexico, but also um, people concerned on linguistics. It, this will also happen and well is there's also this is also happening nowadays and has happened in the 20th century thanks a lot for the question thank you doctor i think that this last part of the european travelers is is, is almost a matter for a new conference a whole new conference <laughs> this is extremely interesting and if mexico is a fascinating country today in those days it could probably was uh, especially adventurous about, uh, it, I don't know when the, for example, the, the Teotihuacan pyramids were unearthed, but at the time for Humboldt came, they were probably not there. They were just yeah. covered or something like that. Yeah, so, if I remember uh, it's 1907, more or less. So more or less, uh, uh, we, even, we even didn't have all the wonders that we can show visitors today. We didn't have them ready at the time. So, um, it must have been fascinating. So let's keep that in, 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 in mind. And now this brings me to my other comment. Yes. And you ended your presentation with something that it is very important to me. And it is that you mentioned that we signed with the Netherlands an extradition treaty in 1907. That is before the Mexican revolution. That is during Porfirio Diaz dictatorship. Maybe it was the great, great, great grandfather of the king who was ruling the Netherlands at the time. So it is very long time ago. What it doesn't stand in my mind is that we still have that treaty as that treaty between the Netherlands and Mexico for extradition. I've been trying to work on that to get people uh, aware that it is I mean, two countries like Mexico and the Netherlands, the stage of development we both have. And more difficult than that, the increasing contacts we are seeing between organized crime in Mexico and in the Netherlands, we need to do something about it. We need to modernize and update the treaty. So um, I, your comment and, and your uh, mentioning it gives me uh, the opportunity to tell everybody and leave this for the record that one of the priorities of the Embassy of Mexico in the Netherlands is to get an updated extradition treaty because in 1907, there were many crimes that did not exist and that are affecting our societies today. So we need to, to work, work on that. And uh, I take this opportunity for uh, mentioning it. Dr. Would you like to close with uh, any other matter, with uh, anything that you say, well, I should have said that, or I didn't have time to mention this and I left it out, whatever you, you want to do as a closing statement. And well, just briefly about the treaty uh, of extradition to mention that after the Mexican revolution, uh, the government of Plutarco Elias Calles decided to, uh, to see the cancellation of all the treaties of amity, commerce, and navigation, but not of uh, extradition. So I think maybe Mexican diplomacy didn't pay enough attention to these treaties of extradition, 
And I agree it is time to do it because the world has changed a lot. So I also want to leave that on the record. And uh, yes, just um, to say that we have to study this relationship more to understand exactly which commerce there existed between the two countries, if there were more problems or more rapprochements that we haven't seen. So yes, I talked only about the 19th century, but it's a relation that we have to explore more. And I think it's quite interesting. So I wanted to say thank you because I, this was my first opportunity to really look into it and to uh, interpret it more. I had seen it as part of European relations, but I really enjoyed this opportunity. So thank you. And I just want to invite everyone to, to look at it from a historical perspective. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Toledo. And I thank everybody for their participation tonight, for joining us. Joining us. And uh, I wish Mr. Mujia, who is telling us that he wants to be a Kenyan diplomat, all the success. This is a fascinating job and it is very rewarding. So I, I hope that you get inspired by Dr. Toledo's presentation. And also it is a, a discipline in which we learn a lot from history. So uh, good luck, Eric, and uh, thank you, Dr. Toledo. Thank you everybody for joining us. And I would just like to end up by, by saying that uh, it is a privilege to be the ambassador of Mexico to the Netherlands because it is probably one of the most interesting relationships we can have in Europe with a country that is in the, the forefront, in the breaking points of innovation and on, te and on technology. And it's probably uh, a leading country in many aspects like water management or, and, and that has been for centuries. So um, there is much to do in joining Mexico and the Netherlands. We also have, we're also a younger country, but also a country that has advanced a lot and a country that can offer a, many, many uh, advantages in a partnership with the Netherlands. So to all our Mexican and Dutch friends, uh, thank you for joining us tonight. And that will be all. Uh, the conference is now, uh, the, the talk is now uh, finished. Thank you. Bye-bye. Goodbye, all.